I would remind members that there is absolutely no spare time at all this afternoon, so I have to be quite strict on timings. On this next item of business being debate on motion 19287 in the name of Ivan McKee on supporting innovation. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Ivan McKee to speak to and move the motion for up to eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. President Officer, business innovation has never been so important. The ever-increasing pace of technological change, the climate emergency, Brexit, all create a highly challenging economic environment. But where there is challenge, there is also opportunity. And it's my job to help business both weather political and economic turmoil and to support them to take advantage of the opportunities that times of change bring. Our First Minister has set an ambition for Scotland to be the designer, developer and manufacturer of the innovations that will shape the future and not just their consumer. This ambition sits at the heart of our most recent programme for government to reinforce Scotland's place as a dynamic, open, innovative economy. The time is right for business to step up to that challenge. My aspirations are clear. I want to see inclusive economic growth benefiting everyone in society, generated by ambitious, innovative businesses, creating high-value jobs that make best use of Scotland's well-qualified workforce. Supported by an effective ecosystem that is easy for business to understand and access, and I want to be able to track spend, progress and outcomes to ensure that we are investing in policies that make a clear difference. In 2017, my predecessor, Paul Wheelhouse, launched our Innovation Action Plan. This clearly articulates our vision for a Scotland where innovation is an intrinsic part of our culture, our society and our economy. It sets out how we will use innovation to drive inclusive economic growth and match the innovation levels of the best performing countries in the OECD. It sets an ambitious target. Yes, I will. Dean Lockhart. Uh, on the target to be in the first quartile of OECD countries for productivity and innovation, um, how is that going at the moment? Ivan McKee. As I said, it sets an ambitious target to double our business research and development investment to 1.75 billion over the decade to 2025. And we are on track to answer the member's question. Latest figures show a 14% annual increase in business R&D in Scotland compared to a UK average of only 3%, with Scottish R&D jobs doubling to an all-time high of more than 13,000. The Innovation Action Plan identifies four... Yes. Daniel Johnson. I thank the, the, the Minister for giving way. I mean, while I recognise those figures, would he not also recognise that R&D spend by the Scottish Government is 20% behind the UK Government? And, and what is the Scottish Government doing to address that? Ivan McKee. Well, I'm just about to go through a long list of things that we are doing, but as I've just said to the member, that gap is closing. We have increased by 14% in the last year compared to 3% by the UK. And if the member gets calculated out, he'll realise that that's a significant closing of the gap just in that one-year period. And that is continuing as we move towards our target of doubling, doubling R&D, business R&D expenditure. The Innovation Action Plan identifies four priorities to encourage more business innovation, to use public sector needs and spend to catalyse innovation, to support innovation across sectors and places, and to make best use of college and university research knowledge and talent. And in the two years since its launch, a great deal has been achieved. We have boosted their support for business R&D grants by 45 million, 70%, invested 48 million in the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland, created the 14 million pound advanced manufacturing challenge fund, invested 15 million alongside Innovate UK and private sector partners to establish the Medicines Manufacturing Innovation Centre, launched the Can Do Innovation Challenge Fund, levering private sector innovation to solve public sector challenges, increased our support for Civtech, the world's first Cross public sector tech accelerator invested £1 million in the College Innovation Fund to help businesses connect better with college expertise, supported the £1 million Cancer Innovation Challenge program, increased their investment in Interface, who have introduced almost 3,000 businesses to academic partners, launched an open innovation marketplace for public and private sector innovation challenges can be posted and solved, invested in supporting academic links 
through programmes such as Knowledge Transfer Partnership Scheme, continue to fund our network of innovation centres up to £60 million over the next five years and piloted new models of procurement for the launch of two innovation partnerships. We have recognised also the need to continually optimise the innovation ecosystem. We have created an enterprise and skills strategic board to increase collaboration between the enterprise agencies initiated in-depth reviews of the public sector, support for innovation, mapped out the innovation system and infrastructure, started work on the creation of a single entry point for business support and set out plans for streamlining R&D support. We're also investing in the future, committing £2 billion of capital to the Scottish National Investment Bank to support mission oriented investments, starting with our transition to net zero, launched a new major export drive backed by £20 million to internationalise our innovation efforts, putting innovation at the heart of our city and region deals with support for projects, including the Image Centre of uh, Excellence in Glasgow and the Data Driven Innovation Programme in Edinburgh and South East Scotland, and supporting entrepreneurs through the Unlocking Ambition Challenge, Converse Challenge, Scale Up Scotland and Scottish Edge. And all of this is having an impact. Witness the range of new products and services that our businesses are taking to market. From Clyde Space to produce and ship more cube satellites than anyone else in the world from the HQ in Glasgow to Caithness based Dunnett Bay Distillers who can now post their rock rose gin through your letterbox thanks to their new recyclable gin pouches. Of course we all know that the contribution that our universities make to global research and innovation continues to be nothing short of remarkable. We sit near the top of the OECD table for higher education R&D spend. We have four of the world's top 200 universities and only last week, I've not got enough time, only last week St Andrews was named by the Times as the UK University of the Year. All of this underpins our success in attracting investment from outside Scotland. We benefit enormously from participation in the EU's Horizon 2020 programme, winning almost 650 million euros for Scottish universities, research institutes and businesses. We're winning more funding from UKRI and Innovate UK for major joint projects between academia and industry, such as the Orca Hub at Heriot Watt, the world's largest centre for research into offshore robotics technology, or the Glasgow-based Artificial Intelligence Health Research Centre I cared. We have four Scottish bids in the final stage of the Strength in Places Fund in open banking, precision medicine, industrial biotechnology and photonics and quantum technologies. All technologies for Scotland that enjoys genuinely world class capabilities. But while it's vital to keep investing in the development of new products and processes, their value can only be truly realised if they're adopted and commercialised to create value for the business and the wider economy. And only by focusing on the outcomes of our innovation investment will we achieve our goals. Increasingly, this is where our attention must be. And it's my task as Innovation Minister to make sure we're investing in the right types of support and the right kinds of projects that will draw investment into the Scottish economy. Meanwhile, the endless uncertainty and confusion caused by the UK government's handling of Brexit is casting a long shadow over Scotland's economy. We stand here three weeks away from the crashing out of the European Union with no clear idea of what might be next other than possibly creating two Irish borders where none existed previously and that is uncertainty is clearly bad for business. The Scottish Government is clear. The message to our European and other international friends is Scotland will do everything in its power to stay open for business, and that includes pan-European research and innovation collaboration. In conclusion, presiding officer, business innovation is of central importance to the Scottish economy. The Scottish Government is determined to further strengthen our innovation ecosystem to continue to benefit from increasing levels of business R&D investment to support our thriving and innovative businesses to provide quality jobs and fair work and to ensure that Scotland enjoys a globally competitive, entrepreneurial, inclusive and sustainable economy. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you. We're already further over time. Can I give everyone notice there may have to be speeches dropped or time cut from them. And I call now Alexander Burnett to speak to and move amendment 19287.1. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Scottish Government for bringing forward this debate today to celebrate the amazing work of those working in the innovation sector and the positive effect that they are having on the Scottish and UK economy. Now, I've been fortunate enough to visit a number of the innovation centres across Scotland and seen firsthand the huge amount of value they add to our industries by drawing on all of Scotland's research ex expertise in their relevant sectors, 
to work on problems and opportunities identified by industry. From aquaculture in Stirling to oil and gas in Aberdeen and construction in Glasgow, these centres are all bringing top quality research and development expertise to the challenges of their respective industry. Now, whilst all are outstanding, the Data Lab in particular has made a great impression. Because data science is a particularly unknown field to many, yet job titles in this field will soon become commonplace. Data science is expected to contribute over 20 billion to Scotland's economy by the end of next year and aims to generate over 590 million in economic and social impact in Scotland over the next five years. And the centres in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Inverness and Aberdeen, which I'll be visiting next month, show how quickly this sector can be rolled out to the benefit of all parts of Scotland. And the hard work of Gillian Doherty and Jude McCorry and their team must be commended in keeping Scotland at the forefront of this exciting sector. But it's important that all sectors receive the backing of both the UK and Scottish Government in delivering for Scotland by funding projects across the country, building on existing talent and infrastructure to continue to transform Scotland's economy into one that is highly skilled and highly paid. As members will be aware, the Economy Committee published a report last year which covered investment in innovation. And it noted that in 2016, total R&D spending as a share of GDP was 1.54% for Scotland, lower than both the UK and the EU. Through the economic strategy, there is acknowledgement that innovation is influential in economic performance, but investment is lacking. And the historic issue of companies being headquartered outside of Scotland could also contribute to low, low R&D investment. Very quickly, yeah. Minister. To make the member aware that it uh, quoted the 1.54 number, the latest number that has moved up to 1.63, further significantly closing the gap with the rest of the UK. Mr Burnett. Uh, thank you. Uh, we welcome any improvement, but I think we note that it's still below uh, the rest. Now, even the Scottish Government's own report noted that their R&D spending is low by international standards, and it states Scotland lags behind key competitors in business expenditure on research and development, which remains at less than 1% of GDP in Scotland. This makes the relative lack of technology-based companies more stark in Scotland and shows that there is a missed opportunity to use the intellectual capital that Scotland has in abundance. But the question is, does the Scottish Government recognise that it's missing an opportunity here in funding our universities and research teams? Now, I will commend the fact that Scotland did increase R&D expenditure in real terms by almost 40% between 2016 and 17. But as the Fraser of Allender Institute noted earlier this year, Scotland is still falling behind in innovation investment. And we need to do better. Because Scotland's R&D expenditure no, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid we're pressed for time. Uh, because Scotland's R&D expenditure is lagging behind at £466 per head, whilst the UK averages at £544 per head. And furthermore, it was noted that R&D activity is heavily concentrated in comparison to the rest of the UK, with almost 40% of total expenditure coming from just five companies. Now, as most investment companies will know, it's important to diversify your portfolio. And I'd like to know what coordination takes place with the UK government, for instance, with agricultural engineering precision emanation centres, and whether they will support calls for farmers and facilities in the North East to be involved. As we have seen, what the correct investment and geographical spread can do. Now, earlier, I referred to the Data Lab, and they have outlined that demand for skilled data scientists continues to grow in Scotland, underlying, underlining its strength as a global leader in the field, which has been reflected in the biggest ever intake of Data Lab MSc students across Scotland. Because we must keep investing if we want to keep up as a global leader and not just in data science. Innovation is about supporting a cross sector of industries. And this SNP government needs to look towards the UK government to find inspiration in how they can do better in supporting innovation across Scotland. As part of the UK government's modern industrial strategy, the Chancellor will announce 250 million in extra funding for its capital, catapult centres that focus on digital medicines discovery, future cities and transport systems. And furthermore, in 2018, a further 780 million 
was announced, meaning that the UK government is spending more than a billion pounds on innovation. Because innovation is the building block in ensuring that Scotland's economy can continue to thrive efficiently and keep up with the UK, the EU and the wider global economy. You know, Scotland used to be a global leader and we must strive to return to that position. In 1707, Scotland's brilliance was unleashed onto the world through the Act of Union. But since 2007, we've had an SNP government fixated on breaking up this union and holding back Scotland's brilliance. And there you must We conclude. can only maximise No, I'm our sorry, no extra time. Please move your amendment. And I move the amendment. Thank amendment. you. And now call on Rhoda Grant to speak to move amendment 19287.2. An absolutely tight five minutes, Ms Grant. The Scottish Government show, motion shows their complacency, their piecemeal approach to the Scottish economy that does not work. We therefore seek to substantially amend their motion to join the dots between innovation, economic growth, earnings and productivity. Their motion praises their efforts, but does not acknowledge that Scottish, Scotland's gross expenditure on research and development per head of population is lower than that of the UK, who spend 13% more per head. Scotland's gross expenditure on research and development as a percentage of GDP was ranked in the third quartile of OECD countries in 2017, as was our business expenditure on research and development as well. Scottish Government constantly bring forward debates on various aspects of the economy, but they show no vision as to how these building blocks come together. We are urging the Scottish Government to bring forward an industrial strategy to have all these interrelated aspects of the economy working together. Increasing productivity is key to achieving sustainable economic development, to raising income levels and to creating better quality employment. The Conservative Amendment urges the Scottish Government to work with the UK Government's industrial... I'm sorry, I don't have time. UK government's industrial strategy, and in the absence of a Scottish strategy, we cannot argue with that. However, the Sc Scottish Labour would have a Scottish industrial strategy to guide policy making, a strategy that would recognise the different socio-economic challenges, the need for faster sustainable economic growth because Scotland lags behind the rest of the UK. Currently, Scotland's productivity is ranked 16th place in comparison with 37 OECD countries, a place where it has languished since this government took power in 2007. To catch up with our competitors would therefore require a significant transformational increase in Scotland's rate of productivity. Manufacturing continues to disproportionately drive innovation, investment and international exports, Sadly, research and development is still heavily concentrated in too few companies and many of those are overseas owned. By some measures, Scotland's innovation performance is improving and that is to be welcomed. However, by many other innovation indicators, our performance is still being outstripped by other countries. In contrast, our universities are at the forefront of innovation. Scotland's higher education expenditure on research and development as a percentage of GDP is the only area where we rank well. Scotland is seventh among the OECD countries and in the first quartile above the UK average. I vis visited the Roslyn Institute and was really impressed by their research and support for innovation. However, there is a disconnect between academic innovation and industrial application here in Scotland. These development opportunities are all too often going overseas. We need to strengthen links between higher education and the business base. And there, there is obvious potential to improve industrial interaction with higher education. At the Rosslyn Institute, they had an incubator unit for small, innovative businesses that were doing their bit to keep those developments in Scotland. The government need to support this and create the right environment for homegrown business to survive and flourish in Scottish ownership. The Royal Society of Edinburgh published an independent review of their Enterprise Fellowship Scheme yesterday and it made interesting reading and provided lessons to be learned. However, it did state that the impact of the fellowship is 52.6 million GVA and it creates 949 jobs in Scotland each year. The last Labour government set up catapult innovation centres which, which have been successful promoting innovation in industry. These centres aimed to catapult innovation research and development from higher education 
into commercial realisation and mass production. And this is a proven model to drive greater collaboration with, between industry and academia. A prime example of innovation jobs in Scotland that have been lost as a result of the SNP's lack of industrial strategy is BIFAB. BIFAB had the opportunity to secure work that was based in floating offshore wind and next generation technology. And this would have put Scotland at the forefront of an emerging industry. Scotland cannot continue to afford to miss out on these lucrative opportunities. Procurement and planning practices require significant improvements if Scotland is ever to act as a catalyst for business innovation. Presiding officer, we believe there must be an industrial strategy at the heart of government in Scotland, driving innovation and strong economic development, delivering jobs, securing technology and advancing our position on the global map. We believe no, you must in an move economy the for the many, not the few. Please move the amendment. amendment. Thank amendment. you very much. I'm sorry to interrupt, but there is absolutely not a squidgen of time left. I call on Alec Cole Hamilton, wherever a squidgen is. You've got five minutes, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to participate in this afternoon's debate. It is a subject which cuts through every sector of Scotland's economy, be that in areas such as vertical farming or in the development of therapies to modify the immune system. Scotland has a long tradition of leading innovation and technology. Pioneering and groundbreaking research and development have been cultivated in our world-class universities, and members need look no further than the joint venture between two of Edinburgh's universities, Harriet Watt and the University of Edinburgh, to develop the UK's first national robotarium by 2021. Increasing links with Edinburgh's informatics community, the recently opened Bayes Institute at Edinburgh, and the Alan Turing Institute, alongside the construction of the National Robotarium, will create additional entry points for collaborative, data-driven research. However, nowhere is innovation more needed than in tackling our climate emergency, the single biggest threat of the 21st century, or any century for that matter. With the passing of the Climate Change Bill, which includes targets to have all emissions offset by 2045 and interim targets of 75% by 2030, we are one step closer. Yet whilst all of this will be transformational, we're going to face many obstacles along the way. What comes next will require tremendous effort, difficult choices and increased resources. We require 35 million people across the UK to change their cars to electric vehicles or give up car ownership entirely. It means growing the market for electric vehicles from 1% of sales today to 100% of sales in 10 years. Innovation will need to drive a transition of that magnitude and those are the sectors where we know what to do. Removing CO2 from the atmosphere at an unprecedented rate will necessitate technologies which aren't even in pilot phase yet. In aviation, where the only serious solution at the moment is to fly less, or in farming, where methods will need to change dramatically, new technologies and innovative solutions will be imperative. Underpinning all of this, we ha will have to reform the regulation of finance and investment and skills and innovation in the industrial support and reshape the institutions of the Scottish Government and UK governments, both centrally and locally. The Scottish National Investment Bank can help in our ambitions by creating a sharp focus on new markets. It needs to drive our transition away from carbon-dependent industries. And I want to see a new UK-wide green investment bank too. If we're to meet our aim of growing our economy by making Scotland one of the most innovative places in the world, investment in education is absolutely vital to that. A University of Scotland report revealed that over the last three years, there have been a 53% increase in the number of startup companies created by students and graduates in Scotland. It underscores why education is key to innovation. The way to establish a high-wage, high-skill economy that we strive towards is to significantly invest in that education and in the skills economy by so doing. We can create a bright and sustainable future for everybody. It is 10 years since the Scottish Science Advisory Council warned that the outputs from Scottish universities are not being captured by Scottish industry. They further warned that that meant that industry exerted little influence on the research undertaken in academia. I'd be very interested to hear from the Minister in his closing remarks how far the government thinks we have moved in those 10 years and how much we've heeded their message. 
As our economy rapidly changes, the need for people to retrain and reskill has never been more imperative. It is no longer the case that the skills learned at the age of 18 or 21 will last a lifetime or a career. The ability to learn new skills or change careers as such is also critical in creating opportunities for people to succeed in adverse economic circumstances and no matter their stage or age of life. And college is a vital uh, portal to further learning and work in that regard. And I must remind the Chamber that 140,000 college places have been lost on the SNP's watch, the over ma overwhelming majority of which have, uh, were part-time when studying full-time just isn't an opportunity for a lot of people. Hundreds of thousands of people, as such, have missed out on opportunities to learn with women, people who need to earn at the same time as learn, and those in caring responsibilities are the most hardest hit. On innovation, the government committed uh, to half a million pounds college innovation fund. I don't think that fully compensates for those losses, but again, I'd be interested in hearing from the Minister as to the impact it has had. These cuts prevented people from retraining and equipping themselves for a career at a time when businesses are reporting in a survey after survey that they are struggling to find the skills they need. We need a massive investment in education, skills and retraining. Then, and only then, Presiding Officer, will Scotland be a pioneer in innovation. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole Hamilton. Call Julian Martin, followed by Jamie Halker Johnson. Ms. Martin, please. Thank you, President <laughs> Officer. The Scottish Government is committed to make uh, innovation, design, and manufacture an uh, intrinsic part of our culture, economy, and society. The National Decommissioning Centre, the NDC, is a clear example of this commitment. It was opened in January this year in Newborough, in my constituency. It's a centre of excellence in the northeast of Scotland, which will develop new capability, skills, and jobs to meet the decommissioning challenge now and in the years ahead. The NDC is a £38 million partnership between the Oil and Gas Technology Centre and the University of Aberdeen, uh, and funded as part of the Aberdeen uh, City Region deal. 100 offshore platforms and 5,700 kilometre of pipeline is forecast to be decommissioned or reused over the next decade. And as we do that, there's safety, efficiency and environmental challenges that have been actively tackled there. By combining industry expertise with academic excellence, the NDC are leading the world in that research and development, not only for the oil and gas industry, but for de decommissioning challenges in the wider energy sector, for example, in offshore renewables. And that uh, work will have a legacy beyond our use of hydrocarbons as we transition to a low carbon economy. There is a model there for an energy transition innovation centre, one that similarly harnesses our local engineering expertise and couples it with our academic institutions, assuming universities will have a replacement for the funding they will lose as we exit the EU. The programme for government rightly sets its innovation ambition in the direction of low carbon technology. And I was particularly pleased to see the announcement that the Scottish National Investment Bank will have that ambition as its focus. Uh, this week's Scotland's uh, Climate Week. Um, and uh, the, our Climate Change Act that we passed just the other week, uh, the world leading emissions targets present Scotland with a unique opportunity to be at the forefront of global action, uh, gaining an early foothold in developing low emissions solutions, products and processes that we can export all over the world. I, I wish I could say that enough action has been taken to date to let's have that foothold, but we have so much more to do. And if we are to harness that opportunity, we need to act much more quickly than we have to date. My region is still too reliant on oil and gas for the local economy. And I know that workers in the North East actively want to be channeling their significant expertise into future energy and not be beholden to the swings and roundabouts of a global oil price or not being left behind as other countries steal a march on us as that transition happens. I know particularly that young people want to be working in low uh, emission energy systems, not uh, reliant on hydrocarbon jobs like their parents. Um, the pulling of the, 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 the funding by the UK government on carbon capture and storage project has set us back years in that regard. Um, so uh, it's not just that, this is not just at the hands at the feet of the Scottish Government and Scottish Government institutions, but the UK Government as well, which failed to recognise the challenge that's ahead of us as we decarbonise. Presiding Officer, I've made my pitch. The oil and gas technology centres and the national decommissioning centres are excellent and groundbreaking and we can learn a lot from them. But the low carbon energy transition needs that model too. And that new focus should have its heart in the energy capital of Scotland, 
which is the northeast of Scotland, and soon. Thank you very much. I call Jamie Halker Johnson, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Mr. Halker Johnson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Innovation should be a driving force in our economy. It's through renewal, invention, and creation that economies thrive, and the pace of this change has increased. In our lifetimes, the instinct towards innovation has only strengthened, and the world moves forward at an ever faster rate. We should certainly consider the challenges that arise from that, but it's also worth considering the enormous world-changing advantages we've seen. Innovation is the main source of sustainable economic growth, and we know that Scotland has in recent, recent years lagged behind the rest of the UK in its economic growth. And I draw attention to sustainability, because sometimes in this chamber, it seems that we're expected to look on economic growth and productivity as somehow unsustainable. While it's right to look beyond the simple growth domestic product of a country, it's wrong to consider that growth in itself as a negative. Members may wish to reflect, for example, on how innovation has benefited our wider environment. We need only look to the significant decline in the cost of technologies like offshore wind in recent years to see the environmental benefits. Much of innovation is about how we manage resources better, about how we can be more efficient. Ultimately, the world will progress forward. The challenge to individual countries is to seize the opportunities that this presents, to be at the forefront of change and to help shape the future rather than simply be shaped by it. To succeed in that, Scotland and the wider UK has to create the frameworks for success. Building the conditions for innovation across Scotland is a key part of that. We've seen very positive work in the city region deals across Scotland. These projects have brought the UK government, the Scottish government, local authorities, as well as other partners together with a common aim. They're promising starting points, but they must be seen as laying foundations rather than as investing as an end point in, in themselves. In my own region of the Highlands and Islands, we've seen some real opportunities seized. EMEC, the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney, is a case in point. And I've been pleased to uh, welcome my colleagues, including Alexander Burnett, to see for themselves the world-leading advances in tidal and wave energy technology that are taking place there. And our universities must also be key drivers of innovation. We've seen some of this work take place with the University of the Highlands and Islands, Harriet Watt, and many other institutions across Scotland. And collaboration must extend further into industries where productivity growth has not been as significant as we might hope. For too many years, industries like construction have lagged behind, an issue that we explored in the Parliament's Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee recently. But in many of these sectors, a technological revolution is just over the horizon. Change is coming. And the basis for that change, as I return to time and time again, is skills. Learning is, of course, central. While our universities can be creative hubs, this process must begin earlier. Because there remains a clear skills gap in Scotland, a shortage between what employers need and what is available in our labour market. The answer to that problem will be found early on. Innovation, enterprise, STEM education, all must be improved if we are to build that skills base we need. Scottish Conservatives have called in the past for greater links between businesses and schools. Some of these proposals were taken forward by the Scottish Government as part of developing the young workforce, and I welcome that. And there is still time for recommendations to be delivered, but these should not be done so in a piecemeal fashion, but rather we should be looking for systematic change on a national level. A focus on STEM education is also vital, Yet in recent years, the hard work has not been done. We would hope improvements were coming, but instead we are seeing the number of employers with skill shortages in STEM areas is increasing, a finding of the report on the Scottish Government's STEM strategy. Presiding officer, we should be forthright in making innovation an important part of what government encourages and supports. That must be across every ministerial portfolio, from education to health, transport to business. It also requires cooperative working between governments at all levels. But above all, it requires commitment and a parliament that respects business and entrepreneurship and their role in our economy. Thank you very much. I now call Kenneth Gibson, who followed by Daniel Johnson. Mr Gibson, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Innovation is a central feature of a strong economy and the Scottish Government defines an innovation as an idea that creates economic value for individuals and society. Innovation can boost productivity, competitiveness and growth. It can also lead to improved earnings for the workforce, greater profitability for companies and contribute to improving sustainable, inclusive economic growth. The Scottish Government wants to build upon Scotland's rich history of innovation by supporting the talent and potential of Scotland's entrepreneurs, investors and businesses. 
The goal is to ensure Scotland is recognised as being a world-leading entrepreneurial and innovative nation. To support innovation, the Scottish Government announced in 2017, Scotland Can Do, boosting Scotland's innovation performance and innovation action plan for Scotland. This plan is designed to see Scotland ranked in the top quartile of OECD countries for productivity, sustainability, equality and well-being. To achieve this ambitious plan, the Scottish Government is working to ensure Scotland achieves a strong innovation performance rating. As part of the Innovation Action Plan, the Scottish Government has committed £45 million over two years of additional research and development grants. Last year, 75 R&D grants were awarded to aid projects, totalling £123 million. Between 2016 and 17, Scotland's gross expenditure on research and development increased by 8.3% in real terms, up to £2,529 million, or £193 million on the previous year. And the Scottish Government is also committed to increasing investment in business, enterprise, research and development as part of its goal to double it between 2015 and 2025. In line with this, BERD expenditure in Scotland in 2017 was £1,247 billion, representing a 93.6% increase in real terms uh, between 2007 and 17. And this stands in stark contrast with the UK Government's increase of only 27.2% over the same period. As part of the Scottish Government's Innovation Action Plan, a can-do innovation challenge fund was established to drive a process known as open innovation. This supports the public sector as it develops innovative market solutions to operational service and policy delivery challenges. 16 organisations have been funded to date to run 18 challenges and over 100 small and medium-sized enterprises have applied to the fund with £1.36 million awarded. A can-do innovation forum is designed to formulate and implement proposals to improve Scotland's innovation performance. This brings together key representatives from business, industry and academia along with the Scottish Government and its enterprise agencies. As someone who represents an Ayrshire constituency, innovation is nothing new to us. Innovation is an intrinsic feature of our culture. That is why many advances that shaped the modern world were discovered or invented in Ayrshire, from fingerprinting to pneumatic tyres. The Scottish Government has committed to investing £103 million towards the, towards the Ayrshire Growth Deal. This includes £40 million to develop innovative projects around engineering, digital automation and manufacturing. In total, the Scottish Government is committed to investing £245.5 million on growth deals in Ayrshire, Borderlands, Murray and Argyll and Butte, alongside £1.275 billion in city region deals, Glasgow, Aberdeen, Inverness, Stirling and Clickmanisha, Tay Cities and Edinburgh. Given that education and innovation are deeply connected, the Scottish Government is working to develop the innovative capacity and performance of business in the economy through training and education. 2019 marks the second year of the College Innovation Fund, which provides half a million pounds to produce new course material to support emerging industries. The government also supports Scotland Can Do Scale, helping entrepreneurs to scale up their businesses through the provision of world-class training. In addition, a £48 million pounds investment in the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland at Inchinnan will make Scotland a global leader in advanced manufacturing. The Institute will offer Scottish businesses access to expert services, advanced demonstrator facilities and training programmes focused on innovative manufacturing. I also welcome the development of innovation and investment hubs overseas. These are designed to work across a wider network, including government, partners and businesses, to support Scottish innovation. Each hub works to promote Scotland's research, innovation, industrial, social and cultural strengths. Lastly, Presiding Officer, to show the importance of developing in in innovation, in June 2018, the First Minister announced a new ministerial post, the Minister for Trade, Investment and Innovation, Mr Ivan McKee. Innovation will improve Scotland's long-term productivity, enable growth and delivery of higher living standards for the people of Scotland. Thank you very much. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by agreeing with, with Ivan McKee in his opening statements about the, the urgent need to look at innovation policy for exactly the same reasons that he set out. Firstly, technology change, uh, which is going to completely alter both the way in which we work, but also the way in which businesses uh, carry out their business, but also uh, for climate change. And the common thread between these is both of these are going to fundamentally change the way our economy works. And the answer to address them is un undoubtedly uh, through innovation. But while he asked me to get my calculator out in response to uh, innovation spent, I'd ask him to make a note, because there's only three numbers that really matter. First of all is the Scot Scottish spend on, on R&D, which is 1.6% of GDP, which is behind the UK spend of 1.7%, but both of those are behind the OECD average of 2.4%. 
And until those numbers change, and until we meet at least that OECD average, there will be still an awful lot more work to do. So there is no room for complacency, either from the government or indeed from the Conservative benches. I'm afraid I really don't have time, and, and I do apologise for that. So let me, make two, uh, 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 let me make two or three points where I think the Scottish Government needs to improve. First of all, I would make the case for the creation of an innovation agency um, to draw together the multiple strands which lie behind innovation policy. That's not necessarily about doing anything new, but certainly about consolidating what uh, currently happens. And I think anyone that knows anything about this area of policy will know the lessons of DARPA. Indeed, it's one of the, the real ironies that that given the US's uh, rhetoric around the free market is actually perhaps one of the most interventionist uh, uh, when it comes to innovation policy, with DARPA having created the internet, GPS, and indeed uh, the voice recognition behind Siri. And I would commend the work of Nesta in this regard. I think they've done excellent work around the role of innovation agencies, um, and I think they, they uh, point to what could be done in Scotland. And, but I think this does stand to, in some regard in contrast with the Scottish Government's uh, record. And while I recognise the initiatives, at the moment we still have a cluttered institutional landscape with innovation falling between uh, Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Funding Council and indeed the Enterprise and Skills Board. And I think until we consolidate that policy effort, I think we'll continue to struggle. Indeed, I also think that the government needs to stop thinking about innovation as something that it needs to support, but also something that it needs to embrace, much the way that Estonia has. Innovation can't be just something that is the business of uh, a private enterprise. It must be seen as core business of the public sector as well. And I think in this regard, the Scottish government must change its relationship to innovation. But finally, I would like to make some brief comments about universities. As well, it is absolutely true that much of the good work in Scotland is thanks to our outstanding uh, uh, universities. Uh, and indeed, uh, you know, we have twice the rate of uh, spin-off uh, companies coming out of our universities as compared to the rest of the UK. The, the, the reality is, and the numbers are clear, that the Scottish government record is not good in this regard. Uh, the recent Audit Scotland report was uh, unequivocal in terms of the record of spend, that it has been cut in real terms by 12% uh, since 2014, that we're receiving a falling share of UK research grants. And this is on no small part because of uh, the grants provided by the Scottish Government for research only cover 80% of universities' costs. That is a, a clear finding of the Audit Scotland re report. So, in conclusion, we must do more. We must at least meet the OECD average of 2.4%. We must join up innov innovation because ultimately there is an urgency in terms of meeting the demands of climate change and of technology change. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Emma Harper to follow by Brian Whittle. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak today. First, I would like to acknowledge all the people across Scotland who day in and day out are coming up with new, exciting and innovative ideas. Scotland does have a proud history of innovation from well-kent inventions like disposable contact lenses, bank ATMs and the MRI scanner and the human papillomavirus vaccine, which is the world's first vaccine decided to prevent a cancer. And the popular video game Grand Theft Auto is a Scottish invention. And there's also more futuristic Scottish inventions like a functioning acoustic tractor beam and a Metaflex fabric, which is basically an invisibility cloak. I am intrigued with that one myself. Scotland has always led the way around the world in science, technology and medicine. And central to innovation is manufacturing, which accounts for over 181,000 jobs and 54% of our international exports. In Scotland, 55% of businesses' expenditure is dedicated to research and development, which allows for the creation of life-altering products, scientific advances and medical breakthroughs, which often become world-renowned. The key to this is ensuring we equip our population with the skills, technical expertise and ability to thrive and create. I'm chuffed that the Scottish Government has introduced a range of measures which give communities, individuals and businesses the skills, support materials they need to succeed. One such scheme is the Can Do Innovation Challenge Fund, which supports many small and medium enterprises in Scotland. To date, over 100 of these SMEs have applied, to the to, uh, applied for this uh, funding, with 1.36 million in contracts awarded. 
One business worth a mention, which is, uh, the Minister visited with me recently, is York Technologies near Gatehouse of Fleet in Dumfries and Galloway. The managing director is Khalid Alvey, and he has designed a machine, a balanced, a balanced coil needle detector, which is used in the manufacturing of clothing, including children's clothing, which improves safety by detecting any broken off needle tips, which may be retained in the garments after they have been sewn. This is a great piece of innovative technology which supports good quality control checks in manufacturing of clothing. And Mr Alvey has responded to me this AM and noted that the Minister has connected York Tech with the managing director of another company, Johnson's of Elgin, who is a cashmere clothes maker. And the Minister uh, had met that uh, managing director at an official function. And both managing directors are now able to meet to discuss York Tech's product and see if any opportunities exist to help with Johnson's product safety regime. So if the Minister can continue to make such good connections with York Tech with other, uh, other uh, producers, Mr Alvey will be very pleased. Presiding officer, there are many fantastic schemes going on promoting Scottish innovation, and I would be remiss not to mention the impact that the uncertainty that EU exit from the, is having by causing people, businesses and investors to fear to come to Scotland. Many parts of rural Scotland rely on EU structural funding, which is often much funded by the Scottish Government. On Friday, I attended the official opening of the newly redeveloped Srinrar Millennium Centre, which was part funded by the EU Rural Development Funding and the Scottish Government, as well as other key important partners. Money from this fund has allowed refurbishment to, and be, has made the place fully accessible, including a change in places room. And this modern hub will be the heart of Srinrar, which will encourage conferences, events and businesses and promote the area. The European money is so crucial for rural development in my South Scotland region. But if we're forced out of the EU without a deal, the future of these vital structural funds is in question. And I would like the Minister to address the impact of this and how it will impact our communities, especially in rural Scotland. Presiding officer, despite Brexit, the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that all Scotland can benefit from growth deal funding. And I'm pleased the UK Government has recently made similar commitment to matching Scotland's, Scotland's ambition for 100% coverage of growth deals in Scotland. This has allowed the Borderlands and Ayrshire growth deals in my South Scotland region to go ahead. And although the UK government has fallen short by £20 million on funding in borderlands, these deals will allow for investment in innovation and economic growth across the region. Finally, presiding officer, I have one small business that I would like to ask for support about uh, from the minister. I'm interested to know what current support there is for accessing uh, um, EU and American markets for one particular company, example of Ladder Limb, which is an innovative product made in my region. And you just managed so, to squeeze in. You shouldn't have kept thank you, so late. Thank you, officer. Uh, thank you. I call Brian Whittle to follow by Stuart Stevenson. Mr Whittle is the penultimate speaker in the open debate. Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, you can disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, but the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward, while some see them as crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do. That's one of Apple's mottos, and I think, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is a timely moment to, to have a debate about innovation coming just a few days after the anniversary of the death of one of the great innovators of the computer age, Steve Jobs. Apple, the company that Jobs co-founded and led to global success, is arguably, arguably one of the best examples of the benefits of a culture of innovation. Apple didn't invent the computer, nor the tablet, or the smartphone, or digital music, but through innovation, it made it more accessible, more usable, and commercially successful. I think it's important in this discussion that we don't confuse innovation and invention. Both are important to Scotland's future success and ensuring that we remain a world leader in research and development. Both rely on new ideas, but where invention is creation of something completely original, 
innovation is taking an invention to find a new way of using it that changes how it was used. To use a sporting metaphor, if invention is the giant leap forward, innovation is the run-up. Without it, you are less likely to clear the hurdle. Now, we do have an impressive record of, of invention and discovery in Scotland. We are the home of countless great uh, inventions and discoveries. The cell nucleus, corn flour, fountain pens, marmalade, pneumatic tires, radar, raincoats, tarmac, ultrasound scanners. So we have a reasonable good track record in supporting innovators in their early stages, setting up, developing a viable product. But where we fall down, I feel, is supporting innovators to grow. All too often, businesses grow to a certain size, and instead of being supported to grow further, they are swallowed up by one of the big players. In a globally competitive world, innovation is the difference between success and failure. Without continuous technological and scientific innovation, we risk losing our reputation as a global leader in these fields. Innovation can mean bringing several different ideas together in a new way, often seeing connections that others have missed. As Henry Ford is often quoted as saying, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Innovation isn't something that is confined to the world of technology and business. It's a mindset that can be applied to almost anything. Many of us will see innovation throughout our regular, regular visits to our constituencies. What I would want to highlight at this point, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, is innovation in the healthcare and how important innovation within healthcare will be to the developing care uh, uh, as we transform our, our healthcare from secondary to primary care. Innovation is only useful uh, if, if it's adopted and integrated. We have a lot of experience in developing new technologies, but our, our record of adopting them is much poorer. What needs to be done is we need to look at the way we fund health innovation. I think there are too many quangos. It's a difficult landscape for business and entrepreneurs to navigate. We need to reduce the complexity. And some of these changes don't cost money. They're about changing the process, changing the attitude of the people working within the quangos. We need to nurture an, an, an innovative mindset. As Albert Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein said, we cannot solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used to create them in the first place. The NHS, like much of the public sector, is both bureaucratic and intensely risk averse. Two qualities tailor made to stifle innovation and quick reaction to changing circumstances. Education is the key battleground. We should be creating an educational environment that nurtures and encourages innovation. Encouraging exploration and rejecting dogma, questioning ideology, taking the wider view, seeing the whole board, the benefits of being a journalist in a wide-ranging education, which is why cutting the number of subject choices for pupils is so damaging, not only for our children's education, but our impacts, our ability to innovate. The ability of teachers to innovate has been strangled by that self-same kind of bureaucracy that stifles healthcare and innovation. Deputy Presiding Officer, I think we all recognise how vital supporting innovation is not only for our economy, but also for our communities, our society and our health and well-being. Much of today's debate has centred around the financial aspects of supporting innovation, but we should not lose the sight of the wider value in encouraging people to have a more innovative mindset and promoting a culture across Scotland that is more open to trying new and innovative ideas. Invest in education, Deputy Presiding Officer, because that is the nursery Thank of you. innovation. Thank you. I now call Stuart Stevenson, the last speaker in the open debate, and your five minutes, Mr Stevenson. Uh, most generous, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, innovation in our modern context plays a critical part in our economic well-being. The process is a kind of creative destruction, echoing what uh, Mr Whittle has just been saying, replacing the obsolete with a cutting edge developing the previously unimagined. It's a catalyst to growth, and that's why it's critical to every economy in the planet. But innovation does not happen in isolation. It requires a rich soil for growth and a foundation upon which to build. Now, there is always a danger, and this debate illustrates it, uh, that we focus on government and private sector spend on research and development. But... It's actually the outputs from that research and development and from spontaneous thinking uh, that is the more important. In other words, how many patents do we produce? How many registered designs and product names do we come up with? How many startup companies beyond Me Too Enterprise? And it's interesting that Brian Whittle referred to Apple because, of course, the iPod, their first music uh, 
uh, kit depended entirely on a chip that was, came from the Wolfson Institute here in Edinburgh. Uh, so we are still doing it. We've been doing it a, a long uh, time indeed. Uh, Scotland wants to be a leader in innovation, and we do put our money where our mouth is. Uh, product and process innovation has a clear link uh, to employment growth, but it doesn't just happen in isolation. It relies generally on the quality of the business environment. The weaker the environment, the less likely innovation will positively impact jobs. It's worth also saying that productivity, we, we want to be careful. Actually, when you reach full employment, productivity falls because the people who you're now getting into employment are often working part-time and are doing jobs that are not inherently productive. But even the least productive jobs can respond uh, to innovation. It's certainly important that we have inclusive growth that matches our innovation ambition, and that means investing in public infrastructure, the fourth uh, crossing, uh, now the Queensferry crossing, uh, originally was budgeted for 3.4 billion. We actually built it for under 1.4 billion. Now, if that ain't innovation in government and uh, stepping up to ambition, I don't know uh, what is. We innovate in housing, healthcare, energy, education, and of course, in digital uh, connectivity. But let me just say, there is one thing that's clearly missing from this, because this is actually a feminist issue. The Intellectual Property Office says that only one in eight patents worldwide are in a woman's name. And that's why our government's focus on STEM for women is vital, because that's a huge untapped source of potential innovation uh, for this country, as it should be for countries uh, across the world. Um, because all the women I meet say they are can-do people, and I have to say, I do say, and I believe that all the women in my life are, are can-do uh, people. It isn't uh, simply uh, just about that. Attitude, culture, self-belief, uh, these are important, uh, important attitudes. Now, presiding officer, the Scottish Government is working with partners to support the, the can-do, uh, and that's absolutely good. Um, we also, of course, have to make sure that people have somewhere they can innovate. We need people to take risks, and we need to be prepared uh, to see failure. Now, Scotland uh, has historically been an innovating uh, nation. Uh, Alexander Burnett seemed to think innovation started in 1707. Uh, well, the Napier bones were developed uh, in the 100 years before that, the slide rule, and of course the decimal point came from John Napier uh, as well. The first coal mining done on artificial islands in Scotland, 1575. But there were inventions after uh, 1707 as well. We bequeathed to the world the overdraft invented in 1728 by the Royal Bank. And relevant to the 1707, we invented the first flush toilet in 1775, Alexander Cumming. Scotland invents the world benefits, presiding officer. You never disappoint. You never disappoint, Mr. Seams. I learn something every time you speak, whether I want to or not. Uh, I, I call Alec Rowley to close for Labour. Mr. Rowley, please. Yeah, thank you, presiding officer. And this has been a, a very interesting discussion and debate on a very important subject moving forward. I was struck that quite a number of members, um, Alec Cole Hamilton, uh, Daniel Johnson and, and, and others talked about skills and, and training and, and development. And I think that is a, a key issue. People used to say that Scotland uh, was world leader when it came to education. They certainly don't say that today. And we know that there are major difficulties in terms of our education in, in, in this country, not least the, the curriculum for excellence and and, and how that's actually coming out. And we need to see the evidence of that so that different cohorts coming forward uh, are either being more successful or not. I do worry for some of the reports that you hear from teachers uh, that curriculum for excellence 
is not going to deliver the innovators of tomorrow that we, we so desperately want to see. But there is also a major challenge in terms of the resource in our schools and massively high class sizes that are unacceptable. If you do the comparison between the independent schools and the teacher pupil ratio is something like one to 14. And indeed the pupil adult ratio is one to eight in a lot of these private schools. And you then look at the state system and class size is a, a 30 plus, then you can see that we've got a difficulty. So if we're serious about this agenda, we need to look at education its entirety uh, for the cradle to the grave. And that was also mentioned by a couple of people about reskilling, the need to skill, upskill and reskill. And yet again, our colleges have seen massive cuts over the last number of years. Um, and as a result of that, it is adult education, adult training, adult skills that has suffered the worst. So if we're serious about this agenda, then we need to be serious about education and, and how, how, how that moves forward. Um, for example, in terms of, um, Rhoda Grant mentioned the, 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 the example of Bifab, where we have, we have um, jackets that could be built in Fife being shipped halfway around the world to a wind farm that is 10 miles off the Fife coast. So we need innovation in terms of renewables, inventions and innovation, but we also need to ensure that we can then take advantage of that innovation and that the jobs and the skills come to Scotland. And again, presiding officer, that is not happening at the present time. We have a target of no sale of diesel or petrol cars by 2032. We are miles away for achieving that, and I'm not sure we will achieve that, but we need to then be asking, where is the innovation that's needed for the future? Is it building these cars, or is it in the technology side? Is it developing the software for these cars? In all these areas, we have major challenges at the present time. Minister? We're 11 years away. I was at a business this morning, CST in, uh, just, uh, in, in Hamilton, who are actually building, using photonics, the devices that go into power the LiDAR, that power the autonomous vehicles and vehicles of the future. So that stuff's happening. You might not be seeing it. You should maybe get out some more. But there's an awful lot of that stuff happening in Scotland at the moment. Mr Rowley. And I do accept that, um, presiding officer. There is a lot happening and a lot of good stuff happening, but it's not happening fast enough. And the concern I have is that we will end up uh, buying these cars, but we, we're not inputting into either the manufacturing of the cars or the software. Company after company after company tell me that they struggle to be able to recruit uh, software graduates, IT graduates. Right across Scotland, they are struggling now to recruit IT uh, graduates. So where, where is that going wrong? Where is the investment needing to go in order to ensure that we have more graduates and we have a more skilled uh, and more able workforce in the future? You know, there's too many kids coming out of primary school not prepared for secondary school, and there's far too many kids coming out of secondary school not prepared for a life of work. And if we're serious about this agenda, then we need to tackle the education issue. And I will finish on that, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr. Rowley. I call on Dean Lockhart. Close with Conservatives. Five minutes, Mr. Lockhart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Much attention in recent years has quite rightly been paid to the importance of productivity in the economy, because an increase of just 1% in productivity would deliver £2.3 billion extra in GDP and an extra £400 million in tax revenues. However, less attention has been paid to the most important driver of productivity, which is innovation. According to the CBI, innovation not only drives productivity, but it attracts international investment, raises living standards, and supports inclusive growth. But the reality is that no government can legislate for innovation. Instead, the role of government should be to create a coherent and dynamic skills, business, and education environment in which innovation can flourish. 
The Minister, in his opening statement, set out a list of initiatives supporting innovation, which we do welcome, but a patchwork of initiatives is not enough to create that environment in which innovation becomes fully embedded in the economy. And that's why innovation in Scotland continues to trail in the third quartile of OECD countries. So, President Officer, it is clear we need to do more to realise Scotland's potential to be a global leader in innovation. So let me address some of the key points raised in today's debate. Alexander Burnett and Rhoda Grant highlighted the importance of R&D spending in Scotland, and we do welcome the recent increase in R&D spend, but the reality is R&D spend in Scotland remains well below UK levels. So the gap the Minister mentioned is still quite substantial. The Fraser of Allender also highlighted concerns that R&D activity in Scotland is heavily concentrated with a remarkable figure that half of total R&D expenditure in Scotland comes from just 10 companies. So to encourage uh, further business innovation and R&D, we need to promote an environment which attracts innovators from across the world to come to Scotland. In doing this, we face competition from the rest of the world and the rest of the UK. And that's why we will continue to oppose the SNP's decision to make Scotland the highest tax part of the UK for innovators. That's an example of creating a business environment which does not encourage innovation. We also need a business environment that encourages innovators to scale up and expand their business. But again, the SNP has done the opposite by imposing the large business supplement on successful firms with the ambition to expand. Presiding officer, we should also be supporting universities and colleges in promoting their vital innovation activities, a point made by the Minister himself, Alex Cole Hamilton and Daniel Johnson. But a recent Audit Scotland report highlighted that university funding has been cut by more than 11% over the past five years. And the Economy Committee heard evidence that the university's innovation fund has been cut by 25% in the past five years, in contrast to a 15% increase in the rest of the UK. Yeah, if the member wants to uh, explain why the University Innovation Fund in Scotland is declining, I'm happy to give way. Um, that, Gillian Martin. I believe that's not how interventions uh, work. You don't work by order. I was going to ask how much universities are losing as a result of having Horizon 2020 EU funding taken away from them. Dean Lockhart. Well, I think uh, two weeks ago the Chancellor announced additional spending in the rest of the UK that will create hundreds of millions of pounds of Barnet Consequentials for Education in Scotland, which dwarfs the spending from Horizon. So the committee, in hearing evidence that the University Innovation Fund has been cut, recommended that the Scottish Government increases it, and I look forward to the Minister's response in his closing. Uh, the negative impact of the increasing skills gap was raised by Jamie Halcrow Johnson and Alex Rowley. This is a particular problem in the innovative digital sector because only 9% of business in Scotland use digital in their business compared to 43% in other countries. This lack of digital penetration in the economy will act as a major drag for innovation activity going forward. And, presiding officer, that's why we have been calling for the establishment of a dedicated institute of e-commerce, a specialised agency that will help firms capitalise on developments in technology and e-commerce. Uh, the final issue I'd want to uh, raise briefly is the need for a coherent policy framework to promote innovation, a point Brian Whittle uh, highlighted, and a point the SEDI has called for in terms of the Scottish Government actively participating in the UK industrial strategy. Innovate UK has invested £2.5 billion across the UK in the last five years, and the British Business Bank has helped to unlock £10 billion of finance for innovation. So, presiding officer, let me uh, wrap up. For Scotland to deliver real potential as a global leader in innovation, we need to see this government change direction in economic policy to create an economic environment in which innovation and business can truly flourish. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Ivan McKee to close the government minister till five o'clock, please. Thank you, President Officer. And it's been a, yeah, an interesting debate and a lot, of, um, a lot of very valuable points have been raised. Um, I'd like to just run through some of the contributions first of all and thank Alexander Burnett for his uh, recognition of the value of the Scottish Government's innovation centres. And I too have visited uh, all of them and see the great work that they, uh, that they are doing. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton uh, gave a name check to the Robotarium. Again, a, a fabulous um, piece of uh, 
innovation happening uh, between uh, Edinburgh and the Heriot Watt Universities, but also talked about the climate change, and that was an, an, an issue that came up across a number of contributions. Um, and it's important to recognise the leading position that Scotland holds globally in offshore wind development and hydrogen, and as was mentioned by uh, Jamie Halko Johnson in Tidal and Wave, and mentioned by Gillian Martin, the work that's happening on decommissioning. So there is an awful lot going on in that space, and it's an area that Scotland is recognised globally from the international trips that I've done um, as being at the leading, uh, leading edge of innovation in the renewables energy space. Gillian Martin also mentioned the Oil and Gas uh, Technology Centre, and it's worth pointing out that an increasing amount of the activity that happens in the OGTC is in, focused on renewables. And also worth mentioning the skills context, the Just Transition Commission um, and the National retraining partnership issues again raised by Alex Cole Hamilton and Gillian Martin the work that's going on there to transition the workforce from uh, to, to the technologies of the uh, of the future very grateful to uh, Kenny Gibson for uh, reminding us that Ayrshire's uh, central role at the center of uh, global uh, global innovation always good to, to remember that um, and uh, thanks to Emma Harper for her name check for York Technologies. Delighted to help and any other SMEs that uh, she wants to introduce me to, I shall do my very best to put them in touch with uh, potential outlets for their, uh, for their products. I want to talk a wee bit about um, Daniel Johnson's contribution um, and I think there was a, a lot of value in that and some things certainly uh, food for thought. It's worth pointing out that Nesta now has a base in Scotland. We work very, very closely with them through the, the innovation forum that I, uh, that I chair um, and very valuable input they make to the ecosystem in, uh, in Scotland. Worth pointing out that the Enterprise and Skills Board, rather than being another player in that space, its role is to coordinate the work between Scottish Enterprise, SFC and other agencies to ensure that there is coordination across uh, innovation and other aspects of uh, of the enterprise and skills area and they're undertaking a significant piece of work at the moment in collaboration with the, the innovation forum to uh, to identify opportunities for where we can streamline and make it more effective the uh, the innovation landscape within uh, scotland rest assured there is absolutely no complacency um, we uh, identify very clearly the challenges in front of us and work to what work towards uh, towards addressing them and a very valuable point he raised about um, public sector innovation, something that I'm very keen on pushing, um, something that I, I am uh, working hard to, uh, to get increasingly on the agenda because you're absolutely right, uh, the public sector can set an example through the innovation it does to streamline and make its processes more effective, makes it much easier to sell uh, that innovation uh, across the rest of the uh, of the economy. Brian Whittle's point about uh, innovation versus invention, and certainly we recognise innovation as being broad, including not just product innovation, but also innovation in service and in process is something that uh, we, uh, we, we continually, uh, continually drive to. And his points around about investment, um, that valley of death, if you like, between startup uh, um, investment and the larger scale investment later down the track is something that uh, affects uh, economies and businesses globally. It's something we recognise. It's something that the Scottish National Investment Bank has a, a focus on leveraging an uh, uh, additional uh, private sector fund to support SMEs as they transition through that, uh, through that challenging time in their growth. And uh, we are uh, focused on understanding how we can best support that through the SNIB and other activities. The point he makes on healthcare innovation, again, as a, a co-chair of the Life Science Industry Leadership Group, this is something I see continually and um, very keen to simplify the route so that life science and businesses have roots into the health sector in Scotland to allow them to use that as a platform to uh, develop their innovations and then globalise them, working very closely with health ministers to, uh, to streamline that, uh, that process. And in terms of the whole ecosystem, we are going through a process at the moment of mapping everything that's in there because, yes, there is some, uh, some clutter. It's important we recognise what's in there. Things done for good intentions, but perhaps a requirement to understand how we simplify that, evaluate the impacts and make sure that they're focused on delivering for uh, businesses. Thanks to Stuart Stevenson for a, a brief tour of the 16th and 17th uh, uh, centuries and um, the, uh, the important differentiate between outputs and, uh, and inputs. 
Um, I think it's worth uh, having a very quick comment on the, um, the issues that were raised by, uh, by the Labour front bench, who I think, in contrast to <laughs> Daniel Johnson, were, were, really didn't appreciate the breadth of the uh, innovation process and activities that are going on there. We had a look back at Labour's industrial strategy, and I hear the, uh, these words spoken all the time, and frankly, it sounds very much as uh, Labour hiding behind a soundbite, frankly, because I don't think they even know what they mean by an industrial strategy. Labour Scottish industrial strategy in 2017, make SIB the industrial investment bank for Scotland. We've done that through the SNIB. Devolve power to communities. We've done that through the city deals. Evaluate innovation centres. We've done that and are ramping up phase two funding for them. Integrate catapults into the manufacturing sector. We've done that through NMIS. Just a few examples of, uh, of the disconnect between Labour's uh, rhetoric and, frankly, their, their lack of understanding of, uh, of the reality. And worth also pointing out to Rhoda Grant when she talked up the Roslyn incubator. It's the Scottish Government put £10 million into the Rosin incubator uh, to get that going. So that's the value of the Scottish Government investment in supporting the innovation ecosystem uh, in, uh, in Scotland. And just very briefly to touch on the, uh, the Conservative uh, amendment to, uh, to the motion. Um, we are very keen to work with uh, UK Government where, uh, where we can get cooperation to understand how we cooperate together. Um, Bays were up only last week to talk through their 2.4% roadmap. Yeah. Scottish Government officials engaged with them in that and uh, one of the, the shared learnings that Bays took away was the value of the interface programme in Scotland and they're looking to roll that out across, uh, across the rest of the UK. But I would ask Conservative members, and I've done this in the past, that they should also recognise this is a two-way street. When I asked them to give it, get support for us to uh, get Scottish representation on the Life Science Council and the Life Science Implementation Group, nothing has happened. We're still refused access to those, uh, to those bodies. We're asking for information about what's happening with the UK Government Share Prosperity Fund. Very little information coming forward on that either. Um, and also on the trade agenda. We are keen to cooperate the UK Government dragging its heels. So again, I would ask the Conservative members here to use whatever influence they have at a UK Government level to help us uh, make progress there. So just to finalise, uh, President Officer, uh, interesting debate, lots of food for thought and uh, the Scottish Government remains hugely focused on what we need to do to evaluate the innovation ecosystem, make it more effective, continually improve it, understand its impact and move towards a Scotland where we're not just the consumer of innovation but we are the inventor and manufacturer of them as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on supporting innovation. Uh, we're going to turn straight to decision time. And the first question is that Amendment 19287.1 in the name of Alexander Burnett, which seeks to amend Motion 19287 in the name of Ivan McKee on supporting innovation, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We're not agreed. We'll move to our division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 19287.1 in the name of Alexander Burnett is yes, 49, no, 58. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 19287.2 in the name of Rhoda Grant, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Ivan McKee be agreed. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may vote now. Vote on amendment number 19287.2 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes 49, no 
52, there were six abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the final question, is that motion 19287 in the name of Ivan McKee on supporting innovation be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Gordon MacDonald on 50 years of the Institute of Occupational Medicine. We'll just uh, pause sh slightly to allow members and members in the gallery to change seats.